for our final panel before lunchtime, and this is Corporate Social Responsibility, the Importance of Giving Back. So I'll introduce our panelists first and then the moderator. Jessica Berman is the Vice President of Special Projects and Corporate Social Responsibility for the NHL. She was actually credited with establ establishing labor peace between the NHL and the NHLPA in January of 2013. She also participates in contract negotiations, grievance arbitrations, and player disciplinary hearings on behalf of the league. Ashley Kern is the Associate Vice President, Community Investment for the Canadian Tire Corporation. She's graduate of the University of Toronto, and she received her MBA from the University of Guelph in 2016. Jackie Ryan is currently the Vice President of Sponsor Sponsorship Marketing and Global Philanthropy at Scotiabank. She's a graduate of the University of Western Ontario. She's worked in sponsorship and marketing departments for Canadian banks for almost 20 years. And prior to landing her current job, she was the Director of Corporate Donations for RBC, where she provided strategic counsel to donations managers and led the head office donations team. And Michael Bartlett, he is the moderator. In 2011, he took the, on the role of executive director for the MLSE Foundation. In 2015, he also added head of community affairs to his role at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. He has previous management experience working with philanthropic organizations such as the Oakville Hospital Foundation and the Canadian Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I'm not sure where he went to school, but I heard him boo Western, so probably not there. <laughs> Laurier, there you go. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you all uh, for having us today. We're excited to uh, give you a sneak peek behind the curtain of uh, global sport philanthropy and investments. Uh, certainly to Trevor and Brian, thanks for making this uh, an important topic as part of your conference on an annual basis. And uh, as you've heard on behalf of MLSC, we're definitely very pleased to be a, a proud supporter of this conference each and every year. Um, you know, there's a few phenomena in the world, actually, in, in my belief, that can rally people like sport can. Uh, whether it be professional sport, amateur sport, sport development at the grassroots level, or even sport for social change, it has a way of rallying people. Um, you know, if I were to stand outside of, you know, Scotiabank Arena on a random Tuesday and hug a perfect stranger, I'd probably be looked uh, as, you know, you know, get out of my space, what are you doing? But if it was in the middle of a Raptors game or a Toronto uh, Maple Leafs game in the middle of the playoffs and the Leafs score and I ru run and hug that random stranger, sport is the connection between us and it gives permission to connect. Uh, communities often tap into what sport can do intentionally uh, to change the world and we're seeing a real priority being made in global sport philanthropy and community investments and the organizations that are represented here are, are certainly leading the way. Uh, the organizations that our panelists represent are mobilizing change through sport. Uh, it's no longer just a game for the not-for-profits. Organizations, globally minded organizations that can reach thousands and, and millions of people around the world with large global footprints are stepping forward to be active contributors to this change. And in many cases, their central figures of this change are sitting right here at this panel. Uh, you met them earlier, Ashley, Jackie, and Ryan, and we're gonna get behind the curtain a little bit with them and learn more about their jobs, learn more about their corporate priorities and how they make decisions, and then also learn more about where this industry is going as a whole. So, Jessica, I'm gonna start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about the NHL sport philanthropy and investment objectives. Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me here today to Brian, Trevor, Patrice, and Mike. Um, at the NHL, uh, I feel like our evolution is really representative of what we're seeing across the industry, both from a corporate perspective and in the sport industry. We've gone through a series of changes which have really evolved to set us up for success in terms of our structure, which is really um, having our organization be focused on aggregating all of our assets that touch the community. And by doing that, we're really al allowing ourselves and positioning ourselves to leverage all of the work that we're doing to amplify our social impact work. And our focus is really on aligning our business objectives with our so social impact objectives really to enhance the NHL as a brand. And we know that this is important from a couple of perspectives. Number one, with shifting demographics that are happening across the world, but certainly in North America where most of our business is based, we, we know that the demographics in our NHL markets and beyond are diversifying. And that next generation, which is such a diverse 
uh, generation is really focused on purpose-driven brands. And so it's really our job in our department, which we now call social impact growth initiatives and legislative affairs, it's really our job as part of the SGL department to be what we say is the conscience and catalyst for social impact and growth across the league to really make this part of the lenses through which all of our business units think about their growth. Now, my experience in this sector is everybody at this panel, myself included, generally has the longest title on their business card of anybody uh, in their organization, and I think this is proof again. Uh, Ashley, you, uh, Canadian Tire, Canadian Tire Jumpstart, uh, leading um, global organization, certainly across Canada as well. Um, and you guys have just recently made some big bets, some big commitments um, for your community objectives. So tell us a little bit about your current priorities. So we're a new team. I'm going to fall off this chair here a little so we're a new team, we um, been five months old now, uh, and it's an offshoot of uh, what used to be the sport partnerships team. So that team manages over 60 uh, partnerships um, at a grassroots all the way to a national level. Most of, you know, some of our partners here at the NHL, we've got deals with all of the teams and, and a lot of athlete deals as well. We uh, recognize a need to um, invest a bit more focus around how we dole out dollars in our communities. Most of our deals already have um, a community component, but we've been managing those more at an ad hoc level. And so it was decided um, kind of six months ago that there was a renewed need to put some more concentration on how we invest and, and activate um, in our communities. So that's kind of the role we've been challenged with. We're still defining our strategy. It's uh, sports been in our DNA as a brand for 95 years. So a large chunk you know, of what we're going to be doing is going to stay in sport, but we're looking at different ways of, um, of maybe activating in this space. On top of which, in addition to working with all of our sport partners, we um, obviously spend a lot of time supporting our charity Jumpstart as well. And so we're still working through how that's going to work, but I think the charity um, is still where we would say most of our philanthropic efforts are. And um, the, this last year, in terms of big bets, uh, we just expanded the charity's mandate moving beyond financial need and moving into the accessibility space. So in September 2017, we announced a commitment to uh, donate, raise $50 million to give back to communities across Canada under a Play Finds a Way campaign. And that's really about making play more accessible for kids of all abilities. You know, you, Ashley, you mentioned just even the, the formation of your department, five months old, it's starting to show how companies aren't just now looking for ways to invest back into sport, but the so what question, what is that turning into? How is it strengthening our relationships at the grassroots level all the way up to uh, the national level? And then what does it mean for a business? Those are analytics that our companies and specifically our roles are now tasked with defining and we'll touch on that a little later. Uh, Jackie, you've, you represent uh, truly a global organization, one that um, invests heavily in sport, but your community philanthropy uh, strategy isn't just sport. So talk a little bit about um, your commitment to sport in Canada and how Scotiabank is, is helping drive that and then how it balances with the rest of the philanthropic objectives of Scotia. Sure, thank you. And thank you, uh, everybody, for being here today. It's my pleasure to talk about this topic. It's something that certainly uh, is, I'm very passionate about, uh, bringing sport and community investment together really ultimately is about making a, a better community, a better country for all of us. Uh, we at Scotiabank as well have recently brought together both the sponsorship marketing group and the philanthropy group together. Um, and as a result, seeing a lot of opportunity there to drive greater social impact. So ultimately, those are our objectives are aligned to that. As uh, if you heard uh, our chief marketing officer, John Doig, speak this morning, he talked about the fact that what's really relevant context here is we're a bank and there are five big banks in Canada and we all kind of do the same thing. We have a lot of products and um, services that are identical or certainly from the perspective of the marketplace. And so we spend a lot of time ensuring that we are differentiating our brand and um, that ultimately drives propensity and loyalty with our customers. So hockey in Canada uh, does a tremendous job of that for us. We have been investing in hockey, began with the NHL 12 years ago, um, and have been investing at the NHL level, all the teams in Canada, and then also locally, we've sponsored uh, over a million kids in community hockey in Canada. And as a result of those efforts, and what's important here is it's both of those efforts, both our investment in kids community hockey and in the NHL and the related teams. Of course, the Toronto Maple Leafs here 
here in Toronto, that is driving uh, tremendous equity in our brand to the extent that when consumers are aware of our hockey sponsorship, our brand equity is twice the score it is normally. And then also those who are aware of our hockey um, investments are three and a half times more likely to consider Scotiabank for a product and service. So these are really, really important metrics that speak to focus and really driving equity in hockey for Scotiabank over time and we're seeing dividends. So ultimately we are most definitely looking to drive brand equity. Um, from a community perspective, uh, Scotiabank has been investing in the community for over 185 years. Uh, we give uh, $80 million away globally through our philanthropy budgets. Um, we have, as I indicated, invested in over a million kids in hockey in Canada. Um, and so our community impact is really, really important to us. And it's just natural. It's in our DNA, um, as is hockey. And so Scotia Bankers overall really see uh, Scotia Bank's investment in the community is really important to them as individuals and really helps them represent Scotia Bank in the community. Which then leads to the next uh, objective is really about engaging our employees and really providing them the tools and resources they need to be out in the community. Um, and ultimately, we Jessica mentioned, uh, you know, being purpose driven in our initiatives. <clears throat> Scotia Bank is very purpose driven in terms of everything we do at Scotia Bank. It's ultimately about helping our customers and communities become better off. So, as an employee, if you have that underneath you, and then you have the investment that Scotia Bank has been making in the community, it really helps when you're out in the marketplace representing the brand. And then lastly, a, a performance-driven objective we have is really ultimately about understanding how we're performing as a portfolio in sponsorship and philanthropy, understanding the competitive set, understanding those who are the best in the business, um, setting benchmarks, and then over time, um, seeing how we do relative to those benchmarks. So we've been at this for about six and a half, seven years, right? Seven years, and so this is really about um, understanding the strength that we have as, as a business in the marketplace for community philanthropy and sponsorship and then how we can get better every single day. Excellent. Jackie, I'm going to stay with you because you touched on uh, employee engagement and, mm -hmm. and each one of you represent an, an organization that has truly made uh, the community strategy core to the business. So how do you go about, and, and I want to go kind of C-suite perspective and also cascading through the entire employee mix. How do you best engage your C-suite um, so that they're as passionate about these community objectives uh, as you are and as your team is? And then how do you cascade that down? You've got hundreds of thousands of employees uh, across the world. Uh, how do you get them engaged in the community objectives that Scotiabank cares about? So I think the good news is that it's in fact bottom up, not top down. So uh, Scotia bankers are highly involved in the community on their own efforts. Um, over 400,000 hours, uh, Scotia bankers volunteered in the community last year on their own regard. We have lots of employee programs that um, plus up some of the efforts that they're doing locally, um, but they're doing it on their own. Uh, and so part of our strategy is to really optimize what they're passionate about, this notion of helping uh, our customers and our communities become better off, giving them tools they need so that they can be out in the community and authentically there feeling like they're making a difference. Um, we do uh, invest around 70% of that $80 million in young people in the community. Um, and that's intentional because young people are most definitely the path to future economic and social prosperity and those two are inextricably linked. So again, employees are naturally just out there in the community, involved with kids, involved with young people to help all of us um, you know, reach for the future and make sure that everybody's well positioned for what the future may hold. So. Ultimately, from that perspective, then you, you'll see our executives are naturally engaged. So it really most definitely stems from the employees at the grassroots level, and then our executives are really there to support. So, you know, in terms of how we engage our executives, um, we, you know, they're on boards, um, but we help to influence um, how they're getting involved. We really do want to make sure that they're optimizing the investments that the organization is making, so they're involved in boards and community initiatives that are aligned with young people. Um, this year in Toronto, our CEO, Brian Porter, is chair of the United Way campaign. Um, and so really, in that instance, he's out in the community talking about um, the authentic role that, that we should all play in driving economic and, and social prosperity and that he's just you know proud to be there and so he brings that message back to the organization and then we rally behind that and again you'll see employees though out on their own regard volunteering raising funds um, because it's core to their purposes to why they come to work every day now Ashley I know certainly that um 
Canadian Tire jumpstart, the engine behind that is often the staff that are working uh, at the ground level, at the store mm -hmm. level, across all of your banners. Talk a little bit about how you're engaging uh, not just the corporate employees up at the Eglinton office, but across, uh, across the country at the store level. Yeah, there's uh, about 60,000 employees across our network. So uh, as a family of companies, uh, people often don't realize the scale of just how big we are um, in Canada. So that's you know Canadian Tire Retail, that's Marks, Sports Check, uh, Pro Hockey Life, our Gas Plus Bars. And really for us, um, Jumpstart really is that kind of connective tissue, that fabric that weaves all of us together. Um, it's consistently ranked in our employee surveys as um, one of the number one reasons why people are really passionate about where they work. And it's something that I think the uh, C-suite has done an incredible job just embedding in how we operate. So we use it, um, we use like um, the charity as a touch point for all of our employees and something that unites all of us. So whether you work at a store or whether you're sitting on the 18th floor with, you know, with our CEO, um, this is one thing that we've, we really have come together and united behind. And I think a lot of that stems from the charity's foundations, you know, starting in 2005 from Martha Billis, who's the daughter of the founder of Canadian Tire. Um, we've given out more than 160, $163 million dollars um, to uh, kids in need, uh, helping over 1.7 million, and are continuing to grow that um, every year. So we're on track to hit 2 million for 2019, which is pretty exciting. That's great. And we find unique ways for um, our employees to engage with the charity. So with Play Finds Way, it was our first year building playgrounds. So we actually had employees come out and do community builds. So and that was a really empowering experience. And and we made sure that we've got a mix of employees. So we don't want you know the same employees from one team coming out. We want a real mix across the banners. And that's something that I think our CEO Stephen Wentmore has done a tremendous job with instilling in us. It's one of the reasons why we also look to all of our sport partners of how we can use those assets with our employees as well. So when we brought the Olympic deal on in 2013, the Olympics, what for us was a way of unifying, again, that employee base around that united cause. And then we're able to marry that with all the great work we're doing with Jumpstart and with the COF um, as a foundation partner. So we're constantly trying to find just slightly different and innovative ways um, to find, uh, to keep our employees connected with us. Excellent. Now, just a, a bit of a different take on the question for you. Um, the NHL's got 31 teams. They're adding another soon. Um, you've got a master plan for NHL's investment in sport and investment in communities uh, that you're cascading out to these teams. How do you connect with teams from Toronto to Nashville, soon to be Seattle, down to Florida, because each of those community needs are different? How do you give them the scope uh, to be independent, but to rally under a, an umbrella strategy? Well, you would have an inter interesting perspective as the recipient of those I'll share plans. It next. You can <laughs> let us know if we're doing a good or bad job. But um, it, it's really, from the league's perspective, uh, it's an interesting relationship that we have with our teams because we sort of sit at this master brand level and we have a lot of power to aggregate and amplify the great work being done at the team level. Um, and it's our job to demonstrate to the teams why it's to their benefit to buy into some of our league-wide strategies. So we look to develop campaigns and programs on a league-wide basis where we feel like there's enough stickiness across the league in each of the 31 markets so that there's a framework in place where teams can buy in and adopt uh, the program or the campaign that we've developed, but leave them room to customize based on what's important to them in their market. So um, by doing that, by kind of overlaying the league lens or the league-wide platform, we're able to really amplify what the league is doing. And probably the, the oldest um, and longest example of that is through Hockey Fights Cancer. I'll, I'll reference it just because it's Hockey Fights Cancer Month. And um, really, that, that's probably uh, before its time in terms of it being a, a CSR campaign, our cause marketing campaign. But really what it does is allow each of the teams to activate in their own market. And we give them parameters and guidelines around what uh, they should or shouldn't do to really buy into this league-wide campaign, then it's our job to really make it feel big. And, um, and, and I think because of that, and because we have a demonstrated history of doing that with that campaign, it's really allowed us, as we've evolved our strategy beyond Hockey Fights Cancer, to other initiatives that are important to us, um, to really say to the teams, hey, we can, we can use that model and really scale it to other areas that we know will also be tied to our growth and 
here's what we're going to give you. We're going to create X, Y, and Z assets. We're going to help you to um, be more intentional about measuring your impact. We're going to amplify your work uh, and make it feel bigger by being part of something that's happening on a league-wide basis and also leave you space to do what you may need to do in your local market that may not apply in other markets. Do we do that? I agree. <laughs> uh, and and it, listen, we see it across the NBA, uh, Major League Soccer, um, CFL now too, and, and the NHL, and it is very difficult um, for any league to try and impose a singular uh, focus strategy uh, on the teams that, that operate in those leagues and the leagues that are most successful and, and certainly Hockey Fights Cancer is a great example of that. Uh, the teams have discretion on what partnerships they strike in the local market, uh, how they go about activating those partnerships and marketing them, even to the date that they pick the game. And that flexibility is important because the variables that we need to consider in Toronto versus Nashville versus future Seattle and Florida uh, those are all different, and, and having that flexibility uh, within an overall CSR umbrella is essential, and I think you'll see it probably the same in Scotiabank at the branch level, the same at Jumpstart and, and Canadian Tire at the store level. Some of that flexibility in the local area is essential for success. Uh, Ashley, Jackie, any consending remarks to that, or do you agree? Definitely, I, I think for sure flexibility. I think what's also important, particularly at the branch level, is to sort of give them the tools that are maybe maybe 60, 65, 70 percent complete, and then let them take it home. Right? Like I think that they they really need a sense of putting their own ownership on it. So providing them that focus, providing them the tools that they need to bring to life whatever the initiative is, but also let them take it home so that they've got something that really allows them to bring their own ownership to the game. Correct. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Collaboration uh, is, quite frankly, certainly for the organization uh, that I represent at MLSE, uh, a key priority for us. We don't engage in any community project anymore unless there's other organizations that are uh, at the table in the trench uh, making investments as well. And this has become a very popular outcome strategy. Uh, very few charities are able to take a dent uh, into the social issue that, uh, that they're tasked with addressing without partnering with other organizations to create a, a larger scale outcome. Um, I want to give each of you an opportunity to talk about a collaborative project because I think certainly uh, as organizations you've been leading the way with this collaborative strategy. A collaborative strategy that you're most proud of and, and maybe even talk a little bit about why collaboration is so important for you to achieve your, your community objectives now. And I'll start with Jess. Okay, sure. Um, I think. Uh, there, there's so many examples of this because, again, th this is uh, the way that we demonstrate that our work, um, I always say, lives horizontally. This is not our work in the SGL department or in CSR space is really not vertical. It's horizontal. It has to live across all of the dimensions of our organization and have relevance. And then we demonstrate that by taking that outside the organization as well because we know that in order to have a greater impact, we shouldn't go at it alone, internally or externally. So um, just because you're, you're moderating and because we're in Toronto, I think, and because Scotia's on the panel, um, maybe I'll talk about the World Cup project as an example of collaboration where um, we really, uh, when the World Cup came here in 2016, we really, uh, it's probably a good case study on how we approach community to say, okay, the business that we're surrounding our initiative with is um, based on the, the fundamental concept that hockey is an integrator globally. So we're bringing this tournament to Toronto. We have representation across the globe coming here. And the reason they're all here is our sport. And what better place to host it than in Canada where hockey is really the thing that helps people to feel more Canadian. And we looked at the landscape on relevant social issues in addition to the business issues and uh, really were keenly focused on the, the new Canadians living here and uh, what are the challenges they're facing and how can we use this platform, this, this business opportunity to really impact uh, social cohesion. And so we worked in, in collaboration with uh, the Maple Leafs and with uh, other stakeholders as well to say uh, it really makes sense to have our strategy be focused on using hockey as a vehicle to help new Canadians feel more of a sense of belonging here. And so um, our, our whole CSR um, initiative around the World Cup was really about bringing hockey 
to new Canadians. And we, we did that through uh, really three, a three part um, integration. The first was through Launchpad, through MLSE, where um, again, bringing together MLSE and us, um, as well as um, other uh, corporate partners like ESPN, um, who funded this, and uh, working with the city as well, we uh, funded a ball hockey program at Launchpad, which is specifically focused on bringing hockey to new Canadians and, and really being intentional about measuring um, whether, in fact, that experience was helping them to feel more Cana more Canadian, more of a sense of belonging here um, and feeling welcome in their new country. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of really interesting outputs that come from that project. The second component was um, bringing Hockey Canada to the table and saying, um, we know that they're such a key partner in the growth of our sport um, and they have such a huge role to play with their kind of centralized and, and national presence that we really want them to be part of this project as well. And so through them, we, we funded a caravan that goes to different schools and community events around the GTA. And um, it's also uh, fundamentally um, based on the same basic premise, which is that we want to specifically target communities where um, people wouldn't otherwise have access and perhaps um, some of these um, immigrant families might be looking for uh, opportunities to help them feel more connected to their new country. Um, and so, so that project is underway as well. And then the third component is our sport pad, which um, was the, uh, the play area that was at the Fan Fest here in Toronto. And um, with Scotia's help, we donated that to the city of Toronto. And uh, that is now installed in Scarborough, where uh, kids in that community are able to play ball hockey. Um, and for all three of these components, um, we're really using this, as I said, as a, as a pilot or a case study with all of these different stakeholders to really weave together a narrative of impact. So um, really being intentional about saying, like, what was the purpose of this project? The purpose of this project was to use the World Cup as an opportunity to demonstrate how hockey can make people feel more of a sense of belonging. And um, hopefully, after some period of time, hopefully three, four, or five years, we'll be able to see some of that impact. And we've been meeting every six months to review all the data. And um, I really think there's going to be some, some great outcomes from that that we'll be able to share as a best practice, which is really based on the fundamental premise that we didn't do it alone. And even though it's harder to engage other partners and sometimes slows the process down a little bit, we really feel like that diversity of perspectives gets us to a better place. Yeah, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And collaboration is, is yeah. certainly not easy. Um, Ashley, certainly your and Canadian Tire's investment in sport has been built on a collaboration model for years, uh, you know, at the amateur level uh, and now at the professional level. Take us through a project that uh, Canadian Tire is most proud of. Yeah, I think you could easily rename our team just the collaboration team. Yeah. Um, Canadian Tire is huge. We, uh, a lot of our initiatives uh, feel like collaborations, even just internally to move things along. Um, but I think for us, uh, to Jessica's point, really we are, I mean, we are a shared service. We operate horizontally across um, CTC and being an extension of, uh, of a partnerships team too. We've got the talent within our team that really looks at, um, has spent a lot of time at building those relationships with our external partners as well. And when you can find, it, it can be more challenging when you bring multiple partners, internal and external, at, at the table to bring something to life. It can be a lot more challenging, and often we're a little bit like the United Nations at the table, um, trying to broker a deal um, that is mutually beneficial for all parties at the, at the table. So I think for us, one of the ones that um, we're, we're all pretty proud of, and give our, our friends at Hockey Canada a shout out here, is um, coming on board as a partner with the First Shift program with Bauer. Um, if you look at our business, we're uh, one of the largest retailers of, well, we are the largest hockey retailer um, in the world. So we have a vested interest in the growth of the game. And working with an existing vendor like Bauer, we already have um, a very strong business relations there. So our merch team um, was excited about the opportunity to collaborate from a, a licensing and a merch lens. Um, from a grow the game, obviously we have a vested interest in keeping the game um, participation rates growing and we'd love to see that even go beyond Canada now as we've acquired Sherwood and we're looking outside of our own borders here too. So from a participation lens, um, that's something that's really about the sustainability of the hockey category for us as a business. Um, our charity does a lot of funding 
in hockey programs already, so we were able to find a way to maybe offset the registration costs of that 199 um, that we asked people to uh, to pony up. And, uh, and then we use our, our dealer networks with Canadian Tire, which is where most people buy their first pair of skates anyway, so it was a natural fit for the CTR brand. So the brand team were really excited to come on board as a title sponsor of that because it was playing in a space where they've been playing for 95 years. And again, it was a, it's a heritage category for us. Um, we use Sport Check and Pro Hockey Life more as positioning more the elite players. So um, First Shift was a perfect spot, perfect fit for the brand team as well. So it kind of hit on, um, ironically, a bit of a triangle for us. You know, merch is on board, marketing's on board, <laughs> jump starts on board. You can't help but live the brand every day here. And um, and then you know, Hockey Canada has been a phenomenal partner the last two years since we've been, come on board in helping find new ways to kind of tweak the program. So to date, uh, 15,000 kids have been introduced to hockey. The conversion rate after the six-week introductory program um, is around 30, 40 percent now into uh, full-time registered programs. Obviously, that's something we are working through and, and figuring out how we can increase that moving forward. Um, and uh, and we couldn't do it without all of our internal partners coming to the table with some ideas and solutions, but also with Hockey Canada helping us out and you know helping uh, launch some new programs out in the territories. Um, working with some of our NHL partners to test some ways that they can get involved a little bit, and then going even into uh, the Parasport area. So leveraging, you know, we've got some relationships with, with Paralympic Committee um, and looking at where we can do some sled programs too. So really trying to make it a holistic introduction to the sport. Um, Jackie, for you, I know certainly we've worked together on a number of, of projects and, and it's quite you, not unique in the banking sector to be involved in large projects that multiple organizations are a part of, uh, including in some cases competitors as well through some of the philanthropic campaigns you're involved in. So talk a little bit about collaboration from Scotia's yeah. landscape. Yeah, that's very true. As I mentioned before, banking is a very commoditized business in Canada, so we are only going to grow through partnerships and collaboration, whether that mean you know, an increasingly uh, <clears throat> concerning uh, digital and technology environment, partnering with universities and fintechs to figure out who we're going to be relative to cybersecurity and blockchain, or and or how we're going to grow our business through hockey. And so uh, we partner, whether it be the NHL, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Calgary Flames, um, to figure out how we're going to grow our business, grow our brand. And so it is entirely through partnerships and collaboration. And I think that, uh, frankly, a really good example would be our Scotiabank Arena project with the Toronto Maple Leafs, or MLSE. Um, you know, it is much more than a name on the side of the building. It's not just about sticking Scotiabank Arena on the side of the building. It's all about providing more for the fans, more for the community, more for our customers. And that comes from a co-creation with MLSE, working as partners to figure out how we can do more for the fans and do more for our customers and the community. And so if you think of, you know, as part of that deal, um, we have extended our, expanded our partnerships with the Toronto Maple Leafs, where we are bringing the Toronto Maple Leafs out into the community with us through some of our community hockey sponsorship programs with the kids. From a Tangerine perspective, Tangerine is, we, Scotiabank owns Tangerine, and they are the sponsor of the Toronto Raptors. Um, the Toronto Raptors will help us reach that 18 to 24 socially, digitally active consumer that, that we know, but we don't know well enough. And Tangerine, with the Raptors, will really together uh, try and understand the millennials, and, and ta Raptors can really help Tangerine grow access to customers and fans um, who have that social and digital affinity and that that uh, you know different mindset from hockey for sure um, you know as part of the Scotiabank Arena deal we're doing programs in collaboration with our scene program which also hits the millennial target um, we're doing a collaboration with the Scotiabank digital factory so we have the MLSE incubator where, where together we will work on uh, solutions to fan engagement through digital and technology and then importantly relevant today is, is what we will be doing with MLSE Launchpad. Uh, whereas part of this deal, we have made a 20, 20 year commitment to MLSE Launchpad. And the two things that we're collaborating on now, it's very, very early days, but one of them is to grow access to hockey in marginalized communities in and around Toronto. Um, we all, I know, support uh, the benefit that hockey brings to 
kids in terms of values and really um, gives them that, that opportunity to thrive in, in, in life. And some of those who grow up, in, grow up in marginalized communities don't have access to the supports that we've all had growing up. And hockey can really put them in an environment where they have access to things that they wouldn't otherwise have in addition to learning to play hockey. Uh, also, uh, MLSE Launchpad, under Michael's leadership, uh, is certainly at the forefront of really cracking the nut on trying to measure outcomes as it relates to charitable and community investment. Very, very difficult thing to do. Um, you certainly have heard of brands talk about inputs. I mentioned that Scotiabank gives $80 million globally to charities across the world. Um, we've heard about um, outputs, how many kids, you know, we've sponsored a million kids through hockey and lots of other initiatives, but what we're all very challenged with doing is talk, measuring the outcome. So what is the benefit of having spent $80 million? What is the benefit of um, providing a million kids with access to hockey in Canada? So we are working on trying to figure out how to aggregate data and really be able to talk to the net social impact of that. So working with MLSE Launchpad, and again under Michael's and his team's leadership, together we're going to try and figure that out. So we're not there yet, it's quite a journey, but it's an exciting journey that under the theme of collaboration, we wouldn't be able to get there on our own. Yeah, and I, I did not orchestrate that shameless plug, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great segue, though, because uh, I do want to dive into measurement, and collaboration has been a natural byproduct or has, has created measurement as a natural byproduct of that collaboration. And I think actually it's a lot easier for Fortune 500 globally minded companies to understand the importance of investing in the people and the tools to measure inputs, outputs, and, and eventually outcomes, uh, because that's what we do you know, corporately uh, day to day. For a small grassroots nonprofit, that is a daunting exercise, that is a daunting spend. They're focused on keeping the lights on and the program running, and the participant data might be as deep as they need to go. Um, but our collaboration, certainly in the corporate sector with an eye towards sport philanthropy and sport investment, uh, has created some opportunities for us to think and act like companies and overlay that commitment to measurement uh, in the investments that we're making. You have each touched upon uh, metrics and analysis that the regular day-to-day uh, -day charity would not be tracking, would not be resourced to track, and wouldn't be able to make decisions based on. Uh, Ashley, talk to us a little bit about uh, the metrics that Canadian Tire is, is holding itself accountable to, both in your investment in sport, but also in your investment in community. Yeah, I think uh, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, Jackie kind of summarized it best. It really is a journey and, and an evolution. We, uh, we're just as challenged by our, our C-suite and uh, you know on the charity side by the, by the board to demonstrate the value of where we're investing our dollars. And traditionally, that really has been around number of kids impacted. We've got, um, we're trying to become a lot more sophisticated and showcase that find a way to tang put a tangible value to those leadership skills and those lifelong skills that children learn through sport. Um, the charity always talks about how you know sports equip kids for life and we all inherently know there's a lot of tremendous benefits to uh, keeping kids active. Um, they become active, healthier adults and ultimately that's who our customer is and something we're really focused on. But in terms of how you demonstrate that back in a fashion that you, you know, your CFO um, understands um, just a straight ROI investment. It's it's tough, and so we um, something we're working with some of our partners with as well to commission um, some longer term research studies. That again, that's challenging too because you're asking people to have faith that you know it's having a positive impact on your brand and reputation. But um, you know, wait two or three years, and we'll have the quantifiable stats from a third party uh, you know research institution that we can back up. So. We don't really uh, have any more answers than kind of what you guys have already been tabled. I think we're all looking at shareholder value and, and obviously we can track brand equity. Um, we do that pretty well, but in terms of getting into the heart of, of the impact that we are having with youth, um, that's a, it's an ongoing process. Now, Jackie, I know firsthand that, that Scotia is working um, diligently and aggressively to really drill down to some metrics that uh, you, can, you can track and um, make decisions based on in your community investment and philanthropy decisions. Uh, tell us about how that's evolved over the last year and you know what was the catalyst for that conversation to say we've got to get deeper into our theory of change to understand what kind of outcomes we're creating. 
Um, the catalyst is really, it, uh, we're lucky enough that we got in front of the conversation before shareholders started asking about it. So I'm thankful that uh, I have great people on my team who talked about, you know, we really need to start looking at measuring outcomes. You know, what's really important here is the charitable sector is just not set up to do so. Um, they're all um, encouraged to uh, manage to around 20% of their operating budget focused on administrations to ensure that minimum of 80 cents on the dollar is actually going into the community. So for the charities that are small to begin with, working on very, very small missions often, and then in terms of how corporations or private foundations are funding them, they're being held to this very, very high regard in terms of only spending 20% of their operating budget on admin. So it's really tricky for them to say, okay, and now I'm gonna start helping you measure outcomes. They are too small to do so. They have capacity that they're trying to build also through collaboration so that um, there are a number of charities who do, do similar things? How can they come together uh, and benefit from collaboration, drive capacity, and then ultimately um, have better funding to then search for outcomes? Because it's very, um, it, some of the charities, it's, it's, it's about chasing the dollars, right? They're gonna go wherever they feel like they can get some funding. So they don't often have time or resources to pause and figure out how to look at their data and figure out how to drive and measure outcomes. And, and technology, plays a big role in that and can play a big role in that. And so that's where, when I use the example of what um, your team is up to at MLSE Launchpad, once once you figure it out, uh, this platform can be leveraged anywhere, right? So it can provide these charities who don't have the expertise or the time to figure out how to drive outcomes. Really, there's a role that we can play as corporate leaders to provide um, the technology, the platform they need so that they can help us with measuring outcomes because it's hard enough for them to put the proposals together, ask for the money, report back on the numbers, and then they just they just can't get to outcomes. So I, th I think that that's, again, we're on a journey. It's going to take technology, it's going to take time, and it's going to take a target. You really need to figure out who you want to target first, figure out how to measure outcomes, and then scale it. Awesome. And so. There's some great work going on, um, and we'll do it together, and we'll do it with some of our other partners. Um, and there will be, though, an expectation very soon, I'm sure, from shareholders uh, that we figure this out. And that's why a scalable model is really where the gold is gonna be. So we hope to be there figuring that out. Great. Uh, Jessica, the growth of hockey, the growth of any sport, uh, is a long game, uh, not a short game. So. Um, Participant data is certainly uh, one metric that, that the NHL can focus on. I'll pivot the question a little bit. How do you keep the NHL leadership team focused on the long game and not looking for instant six month, 12 month, 18 month returns? Um, that's a good question. I, I think uh, as I was listening to both of you comment on it, uh, really being intentional and prescriptive about who your audience is in terms of what you're measuring and how you're positioning the metrics you're you're analyzing and sharing. So um, I, I don't think we it's uh, a good use of our energy, certainly in our world, to uh, focus on uh, trying to shift what some C-suite executives might be focused on. So if they're looking for a short-term lift, I think it's our job to find that short-term lift for them, uh, whether it's looking at um, immediate impact on brand uh, engagement on social media, demographics of who is looking at the, the work that we're doing in the community, um, knowing that maybe strate some strategic objectives might be to uh, focus more on the female fan and demonstrate that our campaigns engage 15% more of the female fan than the traditional NHL content. Um, so, so again, um, kind of meeting them where they are and uh, providing them with answers to their questions. Um, and then once you have them at the table with some of the kind of quick, short-term um, benefits that they're looking for and the value that they're seeking, perhaps using that as an opportunity to help educate them about a longer-term strategy, uh, particularly, as I was saying earlier, in terms of what our, our broader focus is with the shifting demographics that are happening and what the composition of each of our markets are gonna look like in 20 years is just so different from what it looks like today. And we really feel like our, our work uh, will help to prepare the business for that shift, which 
um, is probably further along here in Canada than it is in the U.S., certainly um, in the demographics, but also I think in terms of corporate awareness of the importance of integrating this into your business model. So um, really, uh, we've been trying to be more intentional about using some of the Canadian best practices as case studies to share on our side of the border about how this can be a business focus and um, how you can do good and do well and that those things are not inconsistent and really just being um, relentless at repeating the narrative over and over again with evidence that it's true. And um, over time, with any change effort, you'll find those kind of early adopters, you'll find the people who maybe need a little more time to come along and then you'll find those people that probably it's not worth it's not worth the time to, to bring them along, but eventually they'll be in the minority and you'll have enough of a, of a support in place that uh, the support we need from CFOs and others internally um, to get resources will really bolster the effort that, that we're trying to make. Because it really is, I think, this community investment, CSR, what, however you want to call it, philanthropy, it's really a change effort. Um, and, and that's what we're seeing really across the industry, and uh, we really feel like it's our job to socialize and educate this topic internally to help prepare the business for what's coming, because we know it's coming, and um, we all live it every day, um, and perhaps those who are kind of more directly focused in other business areas and really need our partnership to help them to get there. Well said. Um, we spent a lot of time diving into your organizations, the sector as a whole. I want to spend the last few minutes uh, on yourself as, as professionals. So we've got a lot of young uh, sport business professionals in the room. I would argue, uh, based on what I know about each of you, you didn't see yourself in this role 10 years ago. I know I didn't. Uh, I didn't go to school for sport philanthropy. I didn't go to school for sport investment. Uh, those designations and degrees uh, didn't exist uh, in those days. They do now. So tell us how you three ended up with three of the coolest jobs in sport. Jessica, I'll start with you. Um, well, I definitely did not expect to be in this role 10 years ago. Um, uh, whoever was um, introducing me, I definitely would not say I should be in any way credited with labor peace, but um, I was involved. Thank you anyway. Though. <laughs> Thank you anyway. Um, my, I might have said that to my kids as permission for me to work as much as I was, but um, I definitely wouldn't say that to, to any other audience. Um, I was involved in um, collective bargaining, and that's what I did for 15 years before I approached uh, senior leadership at the NHL and really um, seeing this tide shift, uh, saw this as an opportunity for really me, uh, both personally and professionally, to develop um, experience and expertise and um, really learn a, a whole area of the business. I always sort of felt like my, my first nine years at the NHL were really focused on what I used to describe as everything that had really nothing to do with generating revenue in our, our business. I was very uh, directly focused on the product and the game itself and our relationship with the union and all of the legal issues that kind of serve the basis for us to put on games every night, but was really kind of disconnected from the other half of what we do. Um, and really wanted an opportunity to experience that, not from the legal side, but from a business side. And so um, knowing that this area was going to be evolving and seeing what was happening around the industry, um, I, I just sort of Hail Mary throw, threw it out there, um, would they be supportive of me making this transition, which they were, thankfully, and um, really over the last three years, which is um, the amount of time I've been in this role, it's been um, such an amazing learning experience. I've um, used a lot of what I learned in my old role in terms of communication, I would say, is probably the being clear and, and intentional about communication is really the kind of basic skill that I've been able to apply in my new world, but there's a whole host of other of other things that I've had to learn over the last three years that have been uh, really um, empowering and, and also helped me to see that, um, and I would say to all of you young professionals out there, um, that uh, really learning through experience that you don't need to be qualified to do every single thing in a particular job description, that if you're smart and capable and confident and willing to be humble and vulnerable and learn and listen, uh, that you can stretch yourself to slightly uncomfortable places that might help you to 
be a different version of yourself and um, that that'll just ultimately make you more well-rounded and feel more fulfilled. So I'm thankful for where I'm at. Great. And Jackie, about your path, um, share with everybody kind of how you ended up with uh, the coolest job at Scotiabank, in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, I too wouldn't have suggested this has been this would be my path necessarily. I, I remember people have often asked me, so what was your five, ten year plan? I have to say I've I frankly never had one. And it's probably easier for me now to reflect back and think, so then why am I where I am? And I think ultimately it's driven by passion and and, and making choices that end up in the moment feeling like the right choices that you're making, but being really, really aware of potentially that what not only where that might take you, but what you're leaving on the table. So given I've been in banking now for 20 years, um, it, I started in banking from sport marketing, uh, went to RBC because I wanted to work on the Olympics more than anything. Uh, I went there for a six month contract and spent 12 years there. So I, I think, I know for certain that my passion took me to an incredible job at RBC and the passion caused me to make tough choices during that tough choices during that journey though where i didn't go work in product marketing i didn't go work in risk i didn't go work in those other aspects of the bank um, because my passion wasn't taking me there so i think you need to be really open minded to the cho choices that you're making be aware and then follow your passion and for me it's worked out really really well specifically in terms of the whole community investment and philanthropy aspect of my portfolio. Um, when we, after the 2010 games here in Canada, when I was working for RBC leading the Olympics, um, I'd been 10 years on that file and it was enough. Um, and my boss at the time said, um, why don't you go try and run the RBC Foundation? And I said, I know nothing about that. I can't even imagine why you'd like me in that position. Um, and he said, look, just do me a favor, go there for two years, they need help on strategy, that's your thing. So I said, okay, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. I was really, to be honest, I'm not anymore, but I was very tired of sponsorship. It had been just a really long time and I wanted to do something vastly different. So I went over there thinking, this is never gonna work out. I can't imagine why I'm here. Uh, and it became so obvious why I was there within a couple of days. And I just learned and learned and just embraced everything I possibly could about an industry I knew nothing about. Um, and really learned from the team and really felt like I was able to make meaningful impact on something that I would never have suggested I could. So, you know, it is about being open-minded, vulnerable to what you're stepping into when you don't know necessarily anything about the subject matter, taking it all in and then bringing the experience you have from the past, right? So now we're all sitting here talking about sports marketing and philanthropy. Well, who would have guessed, right? So it's really about taking your passion along with you, being open-minded to learning. Um, and that is how I'm here today and very lucky to be here. Excellent. And Ashley, what about you? These are really tough acts to follow. Um, honestly, I'm incredibly humbled to share the stage with both of you. And it's um, inspiring to know that you don't necessarily need a, a concrete plan to be successful, because I certainly didn't have one either. Um, I always knew that sport was an area that I, I thought I wanted to work in, and it was always something I was really passionate about. I was really fortunate to grow up with a, a grandmother who was one of the first sport producers here in Canada. And um, I grew up following Olympics because both my grandparents worked in rival networks and traveled the world for CBC and CTV um, doing the Olympics. And when you grew up in a household like that, um, it's hard not to fall in love with what um, sport uh, means and, and the impact it can have. And just, it really does unite um, people of all ages and, and diversities and you know, you're rallying the world around um, that one you know, moment in time. So I thought I wanted to, to work in sport and Olympics and then I kind of lost my way and I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a lawyer. And, um, and I kind of did a little bit of a eat, pray, love right after university and, and traveled and decided communications was where I was gonna go. And then I chased agencies for over a decade. I went through three different shops working in marketing and communications and increasingly taking on more work in the community space. But I always missed out on Olympics. We would lose an account that had an Olympic partnership um, just when I was starting. And I was like, oh, I was just, like, just that close to being on the P&G file. Um, my next shop, they took on the, the Canada House business and, um, and I'd just taken a job elsewhere. And so again, I just kept missing them um, over and over. And so I just resolved to be a, a, a fan. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity to uh, come to Canadian Tire, and this was my first job 
um, in a corporation and moved outside of an agency environment and uh, was very fortunate to have a, a colleague who had helped bring the partnership to life at, at CT. And so it was a way in and I was still doing my MBA and I, I really, again, wasn't convinced that working in sport was going to happen, but I had an opportunity to test it out in an organization that has um, probably the only organization in Canada that has a larger portfolio in sport than we do is sitting next to me here. <laughs> so it was a, a tremendous opportunity. I spent the last four years um, absorbing everything there was to know about amateur and professional sport from a sponsorship lens. And I spent the last year championing the, all the great work that we we're doing in our organization um, across different silos, because uh, I knew I wasn't going to stay in a traditional sponsorship marketing path, but I wasn't quite sure where to go to next. And in our structure at the time, um, we didn't have, I mean, community was not an afterthought, but something that we all did from the sides of our desk. And uh, yeah, and again, I'm just very lucky to be open to opportunities and um, really finding uh, just a personality trait. I just, someone gives me a big problem and I will find a way um, to bring it to life, which was why um, was part of the Play Finds A Way project team. We were a small, nimble team of three, challenged with how to bring that to market. And then that turned into a job, so I was very lucky. So I think the idea is really don't be intimidated by, and you talked a little bit about this, but your background, um, your skills are transferable. You can build off those, those professional wins and you're never really quite sure how those are going to impact you moving down the road. Um, but yeah, just stay open to those opportunities and take a, don't be afraid to take a, a leap of faith every now and then. Awesome. So for those of you, and I'm sure you all did, uh, keeping notes uh, at home, we're talking about a sector that rallies communities, where collaboration is core, where measurement is an exercise that you get to own and evolve and determine what's best for your organization and one that rewards people for their passion. Uh, it's a great sector to work in. We've got three individuals here that are leading the way, uh, and we certainly want to applaud them for their efforts, and thank you both, or all three of you, for your time. Thanks.